Good morning. How are we doing this morning? All right, I'm going to let you know ahead of time. I, my voice has decided that it wants to go back to, to junior high boy phase, so I'm losing it. So if you hear, hey, just let it go. Just give me grace and forgiveness and all those wonderful things that Jesus offers. Uh, but we are going to make at, at least a joyful noise this morning. So if you want to stand up, we are just going to get right into some worship. <laughs> Let's pray together. Uh, Father God, we are just um, so thankful. God, that we, um, we've got something to praise you for even when we're sick and life just gets heavy and big. And um, God, you are our hope in all the storms. Um, we thank you for your son Jesus in whom we receive that hope. God, we are a blessed people. And, and we're just going to praise your name this morning. We love you and we thank you for your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not alive all my failures I try to hide It was my tomb Till I made you You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness To your glorious day Your mercy has saved my soul Now your freedom is all that I know The old man knew Jesus when I lay you You call my name You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness To your glorious day I needed rescue My sin was heavy The chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter, I was an orphan Now you call me a citizen of heaven When I was broken, you were my healing Now your love is the air that I'm breathing I had a future, my eyes were open But when you call my name To your glorious day You call my name I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness To your glorious day Amen. Go ahead and greet somebody this morning. Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand. Shaking, and I'm never 
never been more glad And I put my faith in Jesus Cause He's never let me down He's faithful through generations So why would He fail now? He won't Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains, your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Oh, 
Let grace appear The hour I first believed The Lord has promised good to me His words my hope secure Good morning. Well, this past week was a very telling week for some of us. It was a short week of trials that pushed us mentally, physically, and emotionally. Some of us survived, some of us not as lucky. All this leading up to February 14th. <laughs> Judgment Day. Oh, I, I, no, I'm, sorry, Valentine's Day, my bad. Uh, but don't you dare call it a Hallmark holiday. You could lose your tongue for speaking those words. But as I look around, I'm not seeing much for black eyes, bandages, or broken bones. So I say to you, my fellow churchmen, good job. <laughs> With all kidding aside, last week the uh, nation celebrated its day of love on Wednesday. It's a frantic week of people buying cards, chocolates, flowers, or whatever you can come up with to express your love. If you had the joy of being in Walmart last week, you could see the amount of uh, red heart-shaped junk you could buy for that special someone. There was only like five aisles dedicated to it. <laughs> so seeing all this, it made me curious how much of these items get produced and sold. Most of these numbers are just estimates, uh, but there were 250 million stems of flowers sold globally. There are more than 36 million heart-shaped boxes sold each year. And uh, there was 145 million greeting cards sold and exchanged. And this number is mainly for Donnie, but I couldn't find out how many Reese's were sold on Valentine's Day. But apparently 5.4 billion are sold annually. So there's a conversation starter for you. <laughs> Which brings me to this. How many people loved you so much that they sacrificed their only son uh, for your sins? One. How many people willingly died for your sins? One. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Communion is a time to remember the single greatest act of love. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your undying love you show us every day of our lives and giving, uh, giving us your son. In your name we pray. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. Whoever did that, that was awesome. Was that you, Molly? Yep, I should have known. Junior church, five years old through fourth grade, can walk, walk. They, it's, I don't know if I should take it personally that when I say it's time to go, they run to get away from me. Or they're excited about going. That's what it is, Tony. Thank you. Yes. So, all right. So far, we have been working our way through the Gospel of John, studying the words of Jesus when he says those phrases, those I am statements. People are following Jesus all over the place. He's teaching. He's doing miracles. And um, everybody wanted to know who Jesus is. Who is this man who makes the blind see, who makes paralyzed people walk again? Why is he here? What does he want? What is he going to do? Everybody wanted to know. One of the big things going on right now in our culture is, did Super Bowl, was it rigged? Have you seen those, com- or those talks and, you know, was it planned? Who here is an actual chief fan? One, nobody else is brave enough to say so, okay. So, so there's lots of talk, was it planned, was it rigged, was the game, and, and people are talking about it. That is nothing compared to the talk that was happening in Jesus' time. People want to know who Jesus is. Jesus even asked his own disciples, who do you say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah or Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Everyone was trying to guess or figure out who Jesus is. It's still today. People have a lot of opinions on who Jesus was. Some say he was a a great moral teacher. He was here to help people achieve moral excellence, uh, maybe even transcendence. That's what one person I read said. Uh, Some say he was one of many prophets who's come over the centuries. Some people have said that he's a liar trying to gain following and, and get a name for himself. Some people have proclaimed that Jesus was a revolutionary here to bring social justice to the world as an activist marching for people's rights. Some people just think Jesus was crazy, a lunatic, um, but that everyone around him was superstitious and, and realized that maybe he could fill that void that they wanted in that realm. There are a lot of opinions on who Jesus is. And I would venture to say, even in this room, there are different ideas about who Jesus is. This series that we've been going through, the I Am series, we are ignoring all the voices of this world or our opinions and asking who Jesus said he is. We've seen Jesus reveal himself through several I Am statements and these I am statements, he's revealing things about who he is, his mission here on earth, as well as he declared himself to be God. The first time we talked, we looked at the word I am, which is, or the phrase I am, which is ego a me, and he was declaring I am God by saying that phrase. He was going back to the Old Testament and saying that this is the name of God. I am God is what he was saying. The other statements we looked at is, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and life. And each week we've looked at this and and kind of been filling out the blanks around these statements to let us know that what's going on before he said these statements and then how these statements relate to us today. The Gospels are a story that You just wouldn't open up like a novel and start reading in the middle. We've got to start at the beginning and see how they progress and come to us today. Last week, we talked about Jesus raising of Lazarus from the dead in Bethany. A lot has taken place since that event and when he did that I am statement. And here's just the cliff notes, the quick version of it. Right after that took place, the Pharisees called a meeting in the Sanhedrin to figure out what they should do with Jesus. And as a result, they began plotting to kill Jesus. The religious leaders wanting to kill um, one of their own Jews. In the meantime, Jesus and his disciples actually went and hid for a while. That's how much this stirred up controversy in them. Until the Jewish Passover festival, six days before the Passover was supposed to take place, Jesus went back to Bethany 
where there's a dinner given in his honor and Mary poured expensive perfume on his feet. The next day, Jesus left Bethany and headed to Jerusalem. And this is a triumphal entry that we're going to look at in a few weeks right before Easter. And Jesus comes riding into town on a, on a donkey's colt. He, he goes in the city while at the festival. He predicts his death and he pre- preaches about his mission. After all that, they go up to the upper room for a Passover meal and Jesus washes his disciples' feet. How many of you have seen a commercial about something like that message? Okay. Jesus in this meal predicts his betrayal and identifies Judas as the one who's going to ultimately betray him. He also predicts Peter's betrayal and then says, I am leaving and you cannot follow me, but that they will follow later. So that's the cliff notes where all of that has happened and now we're into John chapter 14. We have sort of a cryptic message by Jesus first where he's going and how they know the way and and not to worry about it. And here's what he says starting in verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And, And just so you know, the Greek right there says, as you believe in God, you should also believe that much in me. That's really what it's saying there. So as much as you believe in God, believe that much in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, uh, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am you may be also, and you know the way that I am going. This is a few, very interesting few verses. Christians quote this a lot. Sometimes you'll hear it at funerals or when someone's passed away. Often when people hear this passage, they think of Jesus going in and taking, getting heaven ready and then coming back for us when it is ready. And it says when he's coming back, we think that's the second coming there. I'd like to just change our thinking on that for a moment. Most of the resources I was reading and studying actually point this towards his death and his return. By going to his death through the betrayal of Judas and the crucifixion, Jesus made it possible for them to live in the immediate presence of God. That is where he went. He went so that he could prepare that place and the next place. So he prepares hell so we don't have to go. And he prepares heaven so we can go. Jesus made it possible for people to live in the immediate presence of God. His leaving that evening was actually for their benefit And then he did come back for them when he was resurrected from the dead. Some of you got a little confused when I said that. I understand. I'm not saying he went and prepared hell. Okay, that's not what I... He went and finished and paid the penalty for sins in hell, which means we didn't have to go there. I realized I said the wrong word there, okay? So I backed up a little bit. Jesus is about to face crucifixion and one of the most painful deaths imaginable. I've heard many people say, well, it, it probably wasn't that bad. We... If you really study this, it is one of the most horrific ways of dying that mankind has ever conceived. While he's there, his concern here is for his disciples. He knows he's going to go to this painful death, and he tells them, don't worry. Don't be afraid. He is going away to secure their future, their destiny. And even though he's leaving, he says, I will be back. He isn't going to prepare a place. He has prepared the place. That's the difference here. It's not that he's going and he's building heaven up, and when he's got that room ready, finally he comes down and gets one of us and goes and fills it. He has prepared place. It's already done. And the way he uses this, when I come back, that is him saying, it is finished. That's a big difference than how I was taught. I was taught that... You know, when my grandma died, that's because her room was ready. Well, how long does it take for God to make something? He he made everything with a word. So why would it take heaven so much longer? Which means I had to start looking at this a little different. And the Greeks, when I go, going to death and then resurrected, that's how he's preparing. So that we don't have to go down, we can actually go up. And he says, and then you will follow me and you know where I am going, meaning the second trip. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? 
Has anybody ever told you how to get somewhere and you're like, I, I don't understand what you're saying? Okay, so we lived in Kentucky for a while. They give directions way different, okay? Even Ohio, their numbers and, or their street addresses are, they use the alphabet instead of numbers over in Ohio. Kentucky, this is how they gave us directions. You need to go down in the holler and come up and at the stump, turn right. Go down a ways, and when you see the fallen down barn, that's when you turn left again. Once you go a ways, there's a big rock. Don't turn there. Go further till there's two trees. That's my house. You know what happened when we followed those directions? We were in Ohio somehow. We got lost. And they're like, well, you know how to get where we're going. No, I don't know where you're going. They don't know how to make a straight road in Kentucky. It's all weird. Well, Peter, or uh, Thomas here is like, Jesus, time out. I don't understand your directions. I don't know where we are going. These disciples didn't understand at all what Jesus meant. And honestly, it's hard not to be a little irritated with the disciples' cluelessness. They were with Jesus all the time. He proved himself over and over. He showed them his power and his might. He showed who he is. And if he said, you know where I am going... Why would they doubt? Why would Thomas speak up and say, um, Jesus, I have no idea what you're talking about. It's hard not to be a little irritated with them, but I would have to assume that if we were there in their shoes or sandals, we would have said the exact same thing. We have the full picture. We have all the scriptures here, the Holy Spirit living within us, which they didn't have at this point. And it was normal at times, as well as the disciples, to ask clarifying questions. This here, when Thomas asked, is not doubt. It is inviting Jesus for more information. This is a great question of Thomas. And one of the things these questions of the disciples do is draw important responses and clarifications from Jesus for the disciples as Jesus reveals himself. Jesus didn't do this for the large crowds. He did this for his close followers, those who truly believed. Now, often Thomas is portrayed as the doubter. But I think Thomas right here captures all of them and many times us. That intermental working of most people that go, wait a minute, I want to believe, but I don't get it. He captures something that I know I can relate to. And this is it, John 14, 6. Here's the scripture. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, wait a minute. Before we go here, leave that scripture up. Here's what the scripture really means. The way it's written in Greek Jesus is really saying, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. It's not an and thing. He is just saying three distinct statements here. And this is an important response for a few reasons. It's probably one of the most quoted of all the I am statements. But it reveals about Jesus something incredibly important. No one comes to God except through Jesus. That is one of the clearest things. No one can come to God the Father except through Jesus. This flies in the face of every other belief system in this world. This flies in the face of all of us who think, well, we're pretty good. You cannot get to God. You cannot unless you go through Jesus. And Jesus sets the stage for this I am statement, the, the next one that we're going to look at in a couple weeks, actually. And remember the context. Jesus told them he is leaving. He's going to prepare that place, and then he'll return. They can't come with him now, but later they will follow. He tells them they know the way he is going, which is into God's presence through his death. And they say, how do we get there? How do we follow you? And Jesus says, I am. How do you get to God the Father? I am. How do you experience truth? I am. How do I live? I am. That is what Jesus is saying. 
He is summing up all of this stuff right there that I am. So how does that hit us today? Because, you know, we've read the Bible, we've read this, I believe in it, so um, we're good to go, right? What should we take from this statement? There are three things that Jesus says about himself here when he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Not a way, he doesn't say he is one of the ways, he is the way. There are multiple ways to get to Fort Wayne, right? Right? Right on the count of three, I want you to tell me the main road, not all the roads, just the main road you would get on to get your direction started towards Fort, Fort Wayne. So when I, after I say three, you're going to tell me that road, okay? One, two, three. I know exactly how to get there now. There were a few people that said one, so State Road 1. Did anybody say 69? Okay. Did anybody say 37? Okay. Did anybody go far west, cross 69, and then go down? Because you don't want to take the roads where everybody lives and everybody's driving. You want to take a country road. Okay. That's how my wife and I'd like to go because there's less people. Okay. No cops. (laughs) You need to repent, brother. (laughs) So there are multiple ways to Fort Wayne. We could all sit in our cars right now, and it would be possible for us to all take different roads, completely different paths, and still reach the same destination. But that's not what Jesus is saying when it comes to heaven. That's not how it is with God. First, Jesus is the exclusive way to God the Father. You know what exclusive means? only. He is the only way to God the Father. I want to give a little caveat here. There are two ways to get to heaven. Be perfect. You can live a perfect life. If you cannot live a perfect life, then you have to go through the other way, which is Jesus. Um, I'm looking at most of you. We, We can't, and you're looking at me. We can't take the perfect road meaning our perfectness. So therefore, we have to rely on the perfectness of someone else. So Jesus is the exclusive way, the only direction, the only path. There is no path to having a relationship with God the Father. 1 Timothy verse two, or chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God, one mediator, who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. There is only one person who can unite us with God. That's it. How many? One. You can claim to be a good person. You can try to follow the Ten Commandments, but Romans 3.23 says, for everyone has sinned, which means you can't go to heaven now. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. You can try to argue that your sin isn't a big deal. One sin condemns you to hell. Well, it's not as bad as that other sin over there doesn't matter. He's looking at you. We are not judged based by others' stuff. We are judged by our choices. And if I choose to sin, I get to go to hell. That's my choice. And the only way to leave that choice is through Jesus. It's not just murder, sin. There is no distinction. And at the end of the day, we need to all understand we are guilty. We are all separated from God by our sin. Then Jesus comes, and he is the exclusive way to restore that relationship, to make us right with God. Romans 3.23 may say we all fall short of the glory of God, but look at the next uh, verses here in 3.23 and 24. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God... In his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sin. You have all sinned, but I have made you right through Jesus. That's what God just said there. He did this through Jesus. He is the only way to redemption. Uh, Romans 6.23 says the penalty for sin is death, but do you know what else it says at the end? For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through 
Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift of God is eternal life and it is only found in Jesus. It's the only way we can get that gift. Acts 4.12 says salvation is found in no one else. That's kind of exclusive, isn't it? It's a little offensive that there aren't other ways to God. Well, Jesus said it, God says it. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven to mankind which they must be saved. Jesus is the way, the only way to God the Father. First of all, because Jesus reveals God the Father to us. Look what he says right after this I am statement in verse 6 and 7. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. There is only one way to access God, and it is through Jesus. Am I repeating myself enough here? It is through Jesus, Jesus alone, that we have relationship. That's it. Now, truth has been under attack for years now. We have been taught in schools and in culture and in media and everywhere that truth is relative. There's a new ideology to regurgitate when someone starts talking about truth and facts. This is a real comeback that people are trying to say. When you have an argument and talk to somebody about truth or facts, this is what people are starting to say. A fact is really just something that people generally agree on. So really, a fact can be anything as long as enough people agree. Does agreement make a fact? Okay, we're going to try something. If you have red hair, raise your hand for a moment. Why did I pick you? You'll see. Okay, we got two. There's more than that. Three. Okay. Oh, yeah, there's one. There's a few. Oh, we got some babies. I shouldn't choose the the redheads. Uh, Too late. Okay. So there was a whole statement for a long time that said redheads are going to die of extinction. They are going to be phased out. Okay? And a lot of people agreed on it. And the truth is, how many redheads are you, little babies do you have? Four? Three? Three. Well, that's wrong then. That statement just flew in. My, my cousin, she has four kids. All of them have red hair. But we agree that redheads are going to go extinct. So it's a fact. That's not how facts work. Facts don't change. Truth does not change whether you agree with it or not. We need to understand this. Opinions can change. Right? Opinions change, but facts do not. A fact, in its very nature, cannot be subjective. This idea of not being able to know truth, uh, or of not knowing truth, is not new in history. During Jesus' trial, Jesus said to Pilate, I have come into this world to testify to the truth. Everyone who knows me, who hears my voice, knows truth. And Pilate says, what is truth? It's not something new. It cannot change, though. It's not subjective. Let's just say you were going to ride in that car. We're going to Fort Wayne again, okay? With somebody who wears glasses. You get into the passenger seat, and you notice they don't have glasses on anymore. How would you feel? Terrified. I know who he's been riding with, (laughs) okay? Okay. Now, this is how you see the road, right? Go ahead, hit. No, it's all clear, right? This is how I... Normal working eyes should see the the world, okay? But this is when they're not wearing glasses, the driver, this is how they see. Who would feel safe in that? Two psychos. One of them's my son. Would you believe that this is adequate enough to be safe? You can't tell if it's a tree or a car. You can't tell if it's a dog in the road or a barn, okay? It is not safe because the truth is, even if they say, I can see good enough, I see clear enough, what is the truth? They can't see. It doesn't matter their opinion because truth is not subjective to our personal opinion or desires. I have heard many people with glasses say, I wish I could see better without them. 
I long to see better. In fact, I'm just, and how would this work? I'm just deciding right now I don't need glasses anymore. We would sit there and say, okay, you need a reality pill. Okay, you need to learn the truth. Truth is not subjective. It doesn't matter whether we want to drive with glasses or not. Personal desire we have doesn't change truth. We can't choose what is and what is not truth. Truth is truth no matter how we feel about it. Jesus said, I am the only way to God, and he says, I am truth. He is exclusive truth. And we sometimes kind of blur that part, that, well, Jesus said a lot of true statements. No, he is truth. It doesn't matter what you think or feel or what you've experienced. Truth doesn't change, and Jesus doesn't change. He is truth. Jesus, look what it says in John chapter 1. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. Right here, it's saying Jesus is the Word. That's what commentators know. That this is saying that Jesus was with God and is God all the way in the beginning. Now you go, same book, chapter 17, verse 17. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your Word which is truth. You want to know how to know truth? Know Jesus. You want to experience truth? Start experiencing Jesus. You, we've got to realize Jesus is the only way to truth. Not Donnie, not St. Joe, not any other church. Jesus is the only way to truth. And it says, uh, make them holy or sanctify them by your word. Jesus is the word. He is the only true, true truth. Okay, that was redundant, wasn't it? But yet in this crazy culture that thinks there is no truth, we kind of have to say it this way. There's only one road, one path, one truth that leads to heaven. Anything else is a lie, is false. Jesus is exclusively the way and exclusively the truth. Which leads us to the next. Jesus is the exclusive source of life. The exclusive source of life. We are all, without Jesus, living in death. Without him, we're already starting to fade. Do you know what the most poisonous thing in the world is? Some people scripturally are going to go, well, sin. I just read that it's oxygen. It slowly kills you. You shouldn't breathe. That, that's what one guy said. We shouldn't be breathing oxygen. It slowly kills you. And I wanted, to, I wanted to comment on it and say, you hold your breath then. There are all these things in this world that kill us, but you know what? All of them lead to death, except for Jesus. There is no path of life without Jesus. We are dead in sins. Ephesians chapter 2. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Let's just stop right. How many of us realize that we have many sins? Sometimes we're like, well, I just have a few. You know, I, just a few. But he says that you were dead because of your disobedience, your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of, in the unseen world. He is, in, he is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Because of that, because we were dead because of our sins, eventually we all die. There's no avoiding it. This life is temporary. Science and medicine are working to prolong lives more and more, and try to keep us healthy as long as they can, but eventually what happens? Our bodies fail. We're going to pass away because this world is temporary. We live in a broken, cursed world. In the last sermon, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. There is one exclusive source of life for us to receive, and that is Jesus. No other path can bring us life. And it doesn't just mean life here on earth. It means life starting now and into all of eternity. In 1 John chapter 5, and this is what God has testified. Jesus, God has said this. He's proclaimed it. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. 
Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. Do we see the exclusivity here? Jesus' life, no Jesus, is death. That's it. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. What this means is Jesus is the only way to be right with God, relationship, the, the restoration. is the only way that we can find that path and truth so we can understand who God is. And he is the only way we can start living here and into eternity. I want to make sure that with all the conflicting messages in the world around us, we know without a doubt Jesus is not just a way, a truth, or a life that we can choose. He's not a way. He is the only way. There are lots of beliefs and systems going to say, well, that may be true for you. No, it is truth. He is the way, the, the truth, and he is the life. There is no other. He is exclusive. You want to go to heaven, you have to go through him. That's it. And we need to start proclaiming that message more and more. If Jesus said it's important and it's time Christians start not just living it and believing it, but proclaiming it. If somebody says something contrary, well, that's not what God says. And we back it up with scripture, book, chapter, verse. We sell them, not because we're right, because he is truth. And because I've chosen to place my life into him, I want to make sure I obey and I share that with everyone. There is no other way. Jesus is exclusively the only, but Jesus is inclusive in that the door is open to anyone who wants to walk through it. He will allow any of us to walk in that one way, that one truth, and into that one life. While the world around us wants you to believe that you can choose whatever truth you like or follow whichever religion that they're proclaiming all these different paths are really the same way, the same ways to get to heaven. Billy Graham said this, Jesus begged God to spare him the cross if there was any other way to save us. And what was God's reply? There isn't. There is one way. And it was for Jesus to go through this. God wouldn't have sent Jesus to the cross if, he could be saved, if we could be saved through any other thing like transcendence, Buddhism, worshiping Allah, or being a good person. None of those can save us. Jesus is exclusive, the way, the truth, the life. And as we leave here this week, we need to understand the implications because if he is the way, the, the truth, and the life, then we need to base our life on that. We need to base our choices, our actions, our words, our thoughts. It's much more important that we express that. Here's one of the things that I've noticed about the world. It's getting very loud about what it believes. It is shouting, screaming it. And I even find myself wanting to just shut the door and avoid it. Because it's crazy. Some of the things they're proclaiming, some of the things they're saying is true and right and good and all that, it's just nuts. And I so badly just want to shut my door and say, we'll see. I know where I'm going. But that's not what Jesus did for me. He came knocking on the door and saying, Donnie, you need to open up. You need to accept the way, the truth, and the life. You need to accept me so that you don't live in crazy town anymore. And you can come to heaven. And so as loud as the world gets, you know what Christians need to do? We need to be shouting on the top of the mountains. We need to be singing for the world to hear us the truth. We need to be shining the light of who Jesus is. We need to be proclaiming it. We need every waitress and waiter today who waits on a Christian to know there's something different about them and it's because they know the way, the truth, and the life. We need every person in Walmart 
to know when a Christian comes through that aisle, there's something different because they know the way, the truth, and the life. We need the world to know that there is something different because we know Jesus. And Jesus has set us free from death. He has given me the way of restoration back to God. And it is time, church, that we do it. Not just on Sunday morning where it's easy and we all feel good. We need to do it all the time. Because if Jesus can do it at the foot of the cross, knowing that that was the only way to do it, I think I can do it in the checkout lane. Because he died for me so I can know the way, the truth, and the life. So I better be able to share that same way, truth, and life with others so they can go to heaven with us. The world is hurting and broken. And Jesus provided a path. So let's honor him. Let's honor Jesus by showing and sharing that path to everybody and pointing it out. This is how you find Jesus. Let's stand and pray. Father, as we come to a close, we want to thank you for being the real truth, the real way, the real life that all of us want and so many times we forget. God, I ask you to forgive us when we try to live it based on our own ideas. When we mistake opinions for truth, God, remind us. Bring us back to your path. Revive us in your truth so that we can stand and proclaim it for your glory, for your son's namesake. And God, I do ask that you would stir within this church a revival of who we need to be in here and out there as well. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for coming and providing that path so that us, so that me, who is a worthless sinner without you, can be proclaimed redeemed and righteous through your name. And through that we all pray. Amen. That the highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free.
Yeah. 